On this channel over the last year, we have looked at a number of challenges to Nintendo's handheld crown. Nintendo's undefeated streak began when the original Game Boy saw off stiff competition such as the Sega Game Gear, Sega Nomad, Atari Lynx and PC Engine GT. The next generation saw the release of another Nintendo handheld, but ultimately Nintendo continued to dominate the portable market when the Game Boy Color was successful in its title defense against the Neo Geo Pocket Color. In the next era, Nintendo continued their path of domination when the Game Boy Advance absolutely smashed the Bandai Wonderswan into oblivion, giving Nintendo another age of handheld greatness. But what about the next chapter in the handheld gaming wars? What happened when Nintendo once again went up against an opponent who had beaten them clean in the living room console wars, not once, but twice? If anyone could end Nintendo's handheld monopoly, it was Sony. Today we are going to be looking at the history and functionality of the Nintendo DS's rival, the Sony PlayStation Portable, and checking out if this snazzy little device is worth playing today. Welcome to another exciting episode of Handhelds Around the World. Today I am at the Lasifi Plateau on Crete, not to be confused with the Indigo Plateau which is in Kanto. There is nothing I enjoy more than sitting back relaxing and enjoying a little bit of handheld gaming on my travels as I enjoy interesting and scenic locations around the world. From London to New York to Bangkok and Sydney, there is always somewhere new and exciting to enjoy these little systems. Anyway, today as previously mentioned, the subject at hand is the PlayStation Portable aka the PSP. So let's start by looking at the history of this interesting device. Sony's involvement in games console hardware dates all the way back to 1988, where they began involvement in a joint project with Nintendo to create a CD-ROM add-on for the up-and-coming Super Nintendo console. This device, known as the PlayStation, would have obviously functioned in a similar way to the Mega CD add-on for the Sega Mega Drive. This technology was all lined up, set and ready to go, when suddenly Nintendo decided to betray Sony and throw Sony through the barbershop window. The PlayStation was announced at the 1991 Consumer Electronics Show. However, only one day after the announcement, Nintendo announced that it would be breaking its partnership with Sony and instead be opting to go with Philips, instead using exactly the same technology. The deal was broken by Nintendo after they were unable to come up with an agreement on how revenue would be split between the two companies. The breaking of the partnership infuriated the Sony president, who responded by appointing Kutaragi with the responsibility of developing the PlayStation as a standalone console to rival Nintendo. The end result of this process was obviously karma at its very best. For many years Nintendo had been involved in various shady, head-dreading business practices in which they had used to completely monopolise the gaming industry in certain continents at certain times in history. Whilst these dirty tactics up until this point had always ended up working in Nintendo's favour, this time however Nintendo had stolen the wrong kid's lunch money. In Sony's first console war, the Sony PlayStation completely crushed the Nintendo 64, managing to sell over triple the amount of units that Nintendo could manage. Obviously this time around it was Sony's first venture into the console hardware market, so they managed to beat the Nintendo veterans without even having any experience in the bloody field. So obviously by the time the next generation came around, it resulted in a complete massacre. The Sony PlayStation 2 to this day is by far the most popular gaming platform of all time. The Sony PlayStation 2 with its huge library of games and ability to play DVDs sold a whopping 155 million units, which is a complete whitewash when you compare it to the GameCube's embarrassing 21.74 million sales. The PlayStation 2 was over 7 times as popular as Nintendo's juvenile looking Fisher Price box. So, by this point, with Nintendo not even really looking like real competition anymore, what was the next logical step for Sony? You see, Nintendo had one last stronghold left, and that was of course the handheld market. If Sony could crush Nintendo so easily in the console arena, surely the handheld market would have been a cakewalk too, right? 
The way in which Sony had beaten Nintendo back to back previously was by arguably offering superior hardware and creating systems that were both cheaper and easier for third parties to develop games for. So when entering the handheld race, Sony chose to not fix what was not broken and once again offer up a piece of tech that was technically much more powerful than anything Nintendo had put out in the portable market before. The development of this new handheld was announced during E3 2003 and the system was officially unveiled in May 2004 at a Sony press conference before E3 of that year. The system was first released in Japan in December 2004 which was the exact same month Nintendo released their DS platform. The PlayStation Portable became the most powerful portable system ever when launched. Its GPU encompassed high-end graphics on a handheld, whilst its 4.3 inch viewing screen and multimedia capabilities such as its video player and TV tuner made the PlayStation Portable a major mobile entertainment device at the time. The system also featured connectivity with the PlayStation 3, other PSPs and obviously the internet. The PSP is also notable for being the only handheld console ever to use an optical disc format, Universal Media Discs, as its primary storage medium. When I got a PSP of my own, I picked up this snazzy LGBT model of the device, as I managed to get it super cheap at a local boot sale, as I couldn't see anyone else wanting to own the system in this ugly colour. Personally though, I think I can pull it off. Only the toughest of men can pull off owning bright pink gaming handhelds. So this device is a testament to how manly I am. Yeah. The device itself features the traditional PlayStation triangle, circle, square and X buttons. The PlayStation D-pad also makes a welcome return. The system doesn't offer two analog sticks like that of the PlayStation DualShock controller. Instead we have this little nib thing, which seems to function adequately. The system also only offers two shoulder buttons as opposed to four like you would normally get with PlayStation devices. The start and select button both see returns and it's the first PlayStation device that featured a home button to access the main menu if I recall. We also have the standard volume and brightness buttons on the front like we get with many handhelds. The front of the console is also obviously dominated by the system's 4.3 inch LCD screen which is capable of video playback in 16.77 million colours, which one must say is certainly a technological step up from the monochrome Game Boy. The PSP is rechargeable using an AC adapter. Once charged, the system provides about four to six hours of gameplay, four to five hours of video playback, or eight to 11 hours of audio playback. So to my knowledge, this is the first ever super powerful handheld that didn't offer an embarrassing battery life like the Lynx, Game Gear and Nomad back in the day, this thing is built to compete. There were quite a few different models of PSPs over the system's life cycle. One extra cool feature of some of the later models was that they offered television output. That's right ladies and gentlemen, technically the PSP was a handheld and console 2 in 1. Much like the Supervision and Sega Nomad before it, all of which of course beat the Nintendo Switch to the punch. Sony added TV output to the PSP Slim through firmware update 3.60. It can output in a conventional aspect ratio of 4 to 3 or in widescreen of 16 to 9. The PSP is able to output games, videos and other media all onto television screens. Output onto a television is achieved with a wire which can be purchased separately. I have only recently discovered about the TV output thing personally, but for me I shall now be playing Crisis Core on my telly as soon as I get back to old Blighty. It is of note though, this functionality can only be carried out if you own a television that supports progressive scan. PSPs also use NTSC colour encoding, so European TVs must be NTSC compatible to be used with a PSP. Many financial analysts predicted that the PSP would vastly outsell the Nintendo DS, taking into account all the previous data collected on Nintendo vs Sony. The PlayStation Portable did in fact end up selling very well, with over 82 million units sold, thus meaning for example the PSP was nearly three times as popular as the Nintendo 64. As good as these sales were though, it wasn't enough to even come close to the Nintendo DS. 
which shifted 154 million units, which means it sold nearly as many units as the PlayStation 2, which is the most popular gaming platform of all time. So yes, if you combine the Nintendo DS and PSP sales, results indicate that this was the most profitable handheld gaming war in all of history. So the PSP clearly was very popular, however the Nintendo DS was twice as popular as even that. So let's explore why the PlayStation Portable was so beloved, yet still couldn't take first place. The first and obvious reason that Nintendo held their market share was that the company already held people's trust in the handheld domain. People were on the whole very happy with their Game Boys, Game Boy Colors and Game Boy Advances. So the general attitude of consumers was why fix what isn't broken. New styles of marketing by Nintendo also generated an extra older audience for the DS2, like with the brain training games which were mostly marketed towards senior citizens. Also despite the PSP's power, for me personally it didn't really feel like Sony used it to their advantage with the PlayStation Portable. I felt that the majority of games featured uncomfortably long load times, which goes completely against the pick up and play nature of handheld gaming. Handhelds in my opinion are primarily to be played as short bursts of quick entertainment, whilst on journeys or waiting to do something more important. So an element such as long load times just doesn't sit well in the portable arena for me. It almost felt a lot of the time with the PSP the games were trying to offer a watered down crappy console experience rather than tailored handheld experience we traditionally got from Nintendo products. On the bright side though, at least the two competing platforms were so vastly different, making both devices must own purchases really. There were over 850 games released for the PSP, so amongst all of these console wannabe games, there are plenty of good games to enjoy on the unit too. Come to think of it, another factor that put Sony at a disadvantage with the PSP was that the device was very expensive on release. In North America when the device was launched, the PSP was over $100 more expensive than the Nintendo DS. And over in my home of the United Kingdom, things got even more stupid, as there was an even bigger pricing gap between the two devices. Sony defended the high UK price, which was nearly $100 higher than the price tag in the USA, by pointing out that the North American consumers had to pay local sales taxes, and that the VAT was higher than that of in the UK. Despite all of this, as always with Sony products, the launch was a resounding success at home. All stock nationwide in the UK was sold out within 3 hours of a launch, which was double the amount of units the DS shifted on its first day at home. But as I have stated many times before on this channel, Nintendo have never really had the same cult following in Britain it seems to generate in other parts of the world. So to quickly refresh you, the reasons for DS beat the PSP are as follows. The PSP was much more expensive, the games featured annoying load times, most of the games didn't feel like handheld experiences, Nintendo marketed to new audiences, and the Nintendo brand already had the people's trust in the world of handhelds. Ok, so all this was then, and this is now, so it is also important to see if the PSP is still worth playing today. Next, let's look at some of my personal favourite games on the system. Yeah! The defining game on the whole system for me is Crisis Core the full-blown prequel game to Final Fantasy VII, and the very reason I purchased the PSP in the first place. To this day, it boggles my mind that this game, with so much commercial upswing, has yet to see a release on a living room console. Unlike the original Final Fantasy VII, Crisis Core is an actual role-playing game in which the player controls Zack Fair. The player moves Zack through and between open areas, allowing him to talk with non-player characters, interact with the environment and engage monsters in battle. Crisis Core uses a real-time combat system in which the player can move Zack around, initiate attacks, special abilities and spells. He can use items, block or dodge attacks. This game is a great little gem which on the whole builds on Final Fantasy VII's story in positive ways. It certainly does the job 10 times better than what George Lucas managed to do with the Star Wars prequels for example. The game received all round positive reviews, and most importantly gets massive thumbs up from me too, yeah. It is also of note that there is a limited edition Crisis Core PSP, however unfortunately it gets scalped to buggery by the dirty Jimmy Savile resellers. Much like Final Fantasy VII, Mega Man X is another one of my favourite games of all time, 
and Mega Man X saw a full-on Mario All-Star style remake on the PSP named Mega Man X Maverick Hunters. This remake stays true to the original game in both gameplay and basic storyline. However, as you can see, Maverick Hunter X features a total graphical overhaul with 3D character models, backgrounds, a remix soundtrack, voice acting and added anime cutscenes. In addition to these changes, many power-ups in Maverick Hunter X, such as the armor capsules, are relocated to different levels. The remake also has a few extras, including an original video animation titled The Day of Sigma, which serves as a storyline prequel to the X series. You can also unlock Vile as a playable character, which is another nice little touch. Personally, I will always prefer the original version of Mega Man X, but this remake is a fun effort nonetheless. Castlevania The Dracula X Chronicles is a nice compilation disc of games. This UMD features a 2.5D remake of Rondo of Blood, along with the same game in its original form. This is the first time this version of the game has ever been made available to a Western audience, with it previously being a PC Engine exclusive. The disc also features the game's critically acclaimed beloved sequel, Symphony of the Night. This version of Symphony of the Night also includes the option to play as Maria, like you could do in the Sega Saturn version of the game, which also remained a Japan exclusive. There are also a number of other tweaks that also improve these classic games. Overall, making this a must-have Castlevania game. It is certainly the cheapest way to own physical copies of both Symphony of the Night and Rondo of Blood. Remember Ghosts and Goblins? Bloody everyone loves that game, right? Nothing could possibly ever get annoying about it. So lucky for all of us, the PSP features a little game known as Ultimate Ghosts and Goblins. Ultimate Ghosts and Goblins is the first game in the series to employ 3D graphics, while maintaining much of the 2D gameplay mechanics of the earlier games. There are three specific game modes available from the start, Novice, Standard and Ultimate mode. These new modes to some degree remove some of the frustrations the series is known for. For example, in Standard mode, Arthur starts with six lives and when a player loses one of these lives, Arthur is resurrected on the spot. Arthur's armor can also now resist more than one hit when it's powered up. However, if the player chooses, they can indulge in Ultimate mode that plays much in the same way as the horrifyingly difficult originals. As the title suggests, this version really is the ultimate game in the Ghosts and Goblins series, and people who have previously written this series off as being too difficult may be able to find fun in this game's new game modes too. Loco Roco and Loco Roco 2 are platform games developed and published by Sony Computer Entertainment. In these obtuse games, you control the Loco Roco and steer smiling blobs of goo to the level's exits. It's quite difficult to describe this game, but hopefully the game footage can do most of the talking for me with these ones. The games are overall vibrant and cheery and are exactly the sort of experience that suit handheld gaming perfectly. Reviewers have stated that these games look and feel unlike anything we've seen before and that they show a truly brilliant realisation of how to take 2D gaming into uncharted territory. So, that was some of my hand-picked games for you to ponder over. What are your favourite PSP releases? The PlayStation Portable remains a very popular handheld, even to this day. However, shockingly, it isn't even for the 850 games the library offers. It is for a different reason entirely, which I thought would be impossible to leave out of this video. Basically, the PSP is an extremely easy device to soft mod and emulate games on from other systems. So the majority of people who own these things these days tend to have entire game libraries from other systems all on their PSP devices. In some ways, because of this, the PSP is now somewhat of the ultimate handheld gaming device. It emulates many systems absolutely perfectly and even gives users the opportunity to play most PS1 games to perfection too. Like who in their right mind would ever want to pay Nintendo £5 to play their NES games on their new 3DSs when you already have every game ever made on your PSP instead? Yeah! So, is the PSP worth playing today? Hell bloody yes! It has a fantastic library of over 850 games, most of which go for cheap 
and to wrap it all up, it is the ultimate naughty emulation device too. So you can enjoy entire living room console libraries wherever you go. The PSP never did dethrone the nefarious Nintendo from their handheld throne, and the company's benevolent reign continued. That didn't stop Sony from trying again though in the next generation, but that is a story for the next exciting episode of Handhelds Around the World. Yeah! Thank you for watching today's video. It's always fun to cover handhelds whilst traversing this fine planet. Shout out to Shizuka Kabayashi, Retail Archaeology, Andrew Bazanski, Peter Dawn, Mike Frost, Edward O'Reilly, and all of my other patrons. Thank you for all of your support. If you want to be added to this prestigious list of people, then check out my Patreon page. Don't forget to like, Comment and subscribe and let us know about some of your experiences with the PlayStation Portable. Ta-ta and farewell.